So, good evening. Uh, so, we, we don't want to be uh, not really polite and top, to stop your discussion about Europe that you have already started. Uh, uh, but we just shift the discussion here and then we continue afterwards with you. So, my name is Vedran Jihic. Uh, and I'm going to be uh, the one uh, that is going to ask a few questions. We have a wonderful uh, panel. Uh, uh, and we have obviously the best possible people in the room. Uh, this is always the case. The people that are here are the best possible people. Uh, many people, b many people outside. But at least as a, what, what, what I'm happy uh, is that we have a debate about Europe, whatever we mean when we speak about Europe. Uh, and it might be that we have to, to I mean. Serbia is obviously part of Europe, but at the same time, it seems to be uh, uh, part of, of some other kind of, uh, of European notion. But in any way, uh, it's good that we have a debate. Uh, the debate is entitled, uh, where is Europe heading to? A big question mark, even though this is not that big in the program, but it is a big question mark. Resistance to change and change of resistance. Uh, what we have done uh, prior to the panel, you see six people uh, in the program, uh, and as we want to expand uh, Europe, just recently the reports uh, uh, about enlargement of the European Union towards the Western Balkans were published. As we want to expand Europe and deepen the, the, the European notion, we have expanded the panel, uh, and a colleague from uh, Copenhagen has joined us, and I'm just in a second going to introduce uh, all of, of my panelists. In any way, uh, uh, welcome, and I hope there will be, uh, this will be a nice, nice uh, discussion about Europe. So let me start on my left side, even though we, we have a few people from Friedrich Hebert Foundation on, on my right side, they were complaining, but they, from your perspective, they are on the left, which is good, which is good. Uh, but on, on the other left side, uh, Jelena Vasiljevic, uh, uh, far left, uh, <laughs> from, from the institu Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory and so on. Someone asked me recently, is this institute really leftist one? And uh, now the, the question is answered. Uh, it obviously is. Uh, Jelena Vasiljevic. Uh, uh, next to Jelena Vasiljevic, uh, Hans-Jörg Trenz, uh, University of Copenhagen. Uh, but uh, uh, from Germany originally, and, and Germany seems to be a quite an important country for the future of Europe, but Denmark too. Uh, 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 then we have uh, Daniela Dolenitz uh, from a member of the European Union called Croatia. Uh, welcome. Uh, then Giuseppe Mastruzzo uh, from International University College of Turin. Uh, we have been so intensely discussing and preparing this discussion with you, Giuseppe. <laughs> no, we uh, just discu dis discuss it, discussed basically the spon spontaneity. Uh, how do you say it in English? Uh, uh, but welcome. Nice to have you here. Uh, on my uh, right, but your left side, uh, Ursula uh, koch Laugwitz. Uh, she is director of the Friedrich uh, Ebert uh, Foundation or Stiftung's Office to Serbia. Uh, in Montenegro. Uh, between two uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung's representatives sits uh, Erhard Busek, a dear friend, uh, uh, former chancellor, vice chancellor of the Republic of Austria. Uh, now we have also a, an interesting vice chancellor uh, in uh, Austria, but this, this is not the point to make about Erhard. He is uh, chairman of the Institute for the Danube region in Central Europe, and one of, of the persons that, that, that pushed and helped uh, uh, establishing Center of Advanced Studies Southeastern Europe uh, that is uh, co-organizing uh, this event. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Milan Zivkovic from Macedonia. Uh, director or acting director or running, uh, how, how do you describe yourself? Most, Most important person of the Friedrich Hebert Foundation in, uh, in, in Macedonia. So, uh, we, we, we just discovered that we are seven on the panel. Uh, and if we want to, to, to come to the point, uh, uh, we have to be brief uh, and we want also to discuss with you and, and open the floor for, for a few questions. So my first questions are, my first question is going to be two questions. 
uh, and you can just choose to answer one of them or to, 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 to pick up uh, 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 something uh, a bit slightly different. But uh, when we nowadays start a debate about Europe, we have to quote whom? Obviously French President uh, Macron, whether we want it or not, we have to. Uh, he just delivered this speech a uh, few days ago in the European Parliament. A lot of reactions, a lot of debates. Uh, here in the Balkans uh, uh, or in the Serbian media, there were like headlines that France is rejecting the future of the Balkans and smashing the, the door. Uh, uh, and uh, in, in Europe, there is a huge debate. Uh, and I just uh, will pick up like two or three quotes from his speech and then ask you to reflect uh, on it. So the first one, we want Europe in which authority of democracy prevails and not authoritarian democracy. Uh, and then he continued, Europe is in a civil war and is fascinated with the illiberal. Uh, and there is a new context of division and indeed doubt within Europe about the future of Europe. So uh, 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 a clear clear positioning against the illiberal and authoritarian tendencies and at least uh, uh, in his speech uh, uh, fight to restore authority of democracy. And my question would be, is this the fight, the major fight that we have right now? Is this going to be decisive for the future of Europe uh, and how you see it? And the second one is a, is a I mean, it, 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 it goes where Macron uh, starts, uh, uh, makes the next step. Uh, and this is the, uh, we have been speaking and, and, and arguing about the crisis of Europe for now ne nearly a decade, starting from the uh, uh, constitutional crisis to 15, to five, to five, to six, uh, then going on to Greek crisis, economic crisis, migration crisis under quotation marks, et cetera, et cetera, Brexit. Uh, and, and the question is, can Europe exist uh, without being in crisis? Uh, is this like the permanent status uh, that is needed in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to have this Europeanness uh, reconstructed and remade again and again? Or are we in a moment where uh, this kind of crisis that we have right now is threatening to destroy uh, the notion of Europe as we, we have known it? So, uh, this is just for the beginning. Uh, I would say it's good to start with Jelena. <laughs> wow. Well, <clears throat> thank you for asking these well, very complex, very difficult questions. I'm not really sure I'll be able to, to give um, any meaningful comments on them. Um, well, first of all, uh, illiberal tendencies and uh, authoritarian uh, tendencies in Europe and how to fight them. And I think that there's a, there's a growing consensus in core European states that um, authoritarian tendencies are something to be, to be uh, something that we need to fight against. And they're primarily big problems are Poland and Hungary, obviously. But I think that also some very important questions is what are the democratic values that should be defined? So what is the liberal Europe? Okay, we know what's, what is illiberal usurpation of uh, judiciary uh, and um, uh, xenophobic uh, discourses and we can pinpoint uh, illiberal tendencies but we also need some kind of consensus or at least meaningful debate about what are the core democratic values of Europe. Um, uh, is it how do we reconcile economic and social rights and how do we, uh, we we've seen you mentioned Macron and we've seen how big waves of demonstrations in France because of some neoliberal reforms that, that he's pushing forward and I think we really need to understand that uh, even that we can have uh, we can have leaders political leaders and political elites that are ready to condemn any kind of xenophobia or Islamophobia and other tendencies. Macron was very, very explicit about it, especially when he addressed um, uh, uh, last year uh, commemoration, uh, commemoration of um, 
uh, uh, attacks on, on Jews in, in, in Vichy, France, and everything was very explicit about it, but he's also pushing some reforms which are severely jeopardizing some social rights. So uh, can we really imagine European uh, democratic values and, and liberalism, liberal values if you want, uh, without without firm consensus about social rights that we need to protect, and I think that's that's a very important discussion to have in mind. So, uh, I would say that the major crisis, um, if you want, in terms of, of notion, in terms of ideology, not a, not, a, not not an economic crisis, a political crisis, but um, ideological crisis that Europe is facing, is uh, the very definition of democracy and democratic and social rights. Uh, and I think that we should, uh, we should be concerned about that. And we should also, now I have to talk from the position of, of a citizen of a country in, that is not part of the EU. So we are very much concerned that EU is uh, actually well, showing support or at least not condemning enough, strongly enough authoritarian tendencies in many Western Balkan countries. And um, just because uh, these elites are doing something that that uh, European core countries think that it's good for the stability in the region. So we also, that also puts into question uh, European values and the future of Europe. So for now, that will be it. Thanks, Jelna. Hans Jörg uh, from Copenhagen, how does it look a bit, we hope a bit differently? Yeah, I'm not talking here from a Nordic perspective, but I'm coming back uh, to your question about uh, Macron, and maybe I should remind that Macron, of course, is French. So what he is doing here is he is defending the ideals of the French Revolution, which is to fight illiberalism and authoritarianism. And um, from my perspective, uh, I think he has a point, and uh, this might be indeed the major challenge that Europe is facing, that actually not only Europe, but also the US are facing, that the Western world is facing, which is to kind of uh, fight for the idea of enlightenment. The Europe of enlightenment that the European Union uh, was standing for, uh, for decades. And this has to do with an egalitarian uh, society, with a just and egalitarian society, with the notion of liberty and freedom, and with some idea of rationality and truth. And if you look at the major challenges that the Western world is facing, they have to do with precisely these three dimensions more and more injustices at global scale, uh, threats to our freedom, um, uh, freedom of speech, but also freedom of movement, and um, threats to uh, notions of truth and rationality. And I don't think that the European Union has to fight for this. It will probably also not struggle for this. The European Union is not the kind of entity that, uh, that carries forward uh, heavy struggles. I think the European Union must simply stand for this, um, uh, for these values uh, that are part of the European heritage and that are currently under threat and uh, kind of make incremental steps and incremental policies that stand uh, for these values. Okay, so we're just, we're taking turns. Um, Vedan introduced me as, you know, I, I ended up as somebody who's representing Croatia, which <laughs> I really don't, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Um, so I'm a professor at the University of Zagreb, and maybe, uh, you know, for this audience might also be interested uh, that uh, last year I took part in uh, forming um, a municipal platform, a new political platform, which ran in the local election in Zagreb, which is called Zagreb Inash, which won eight and a half percent. So this is just so that you know I have both you know, hats and uh, maybe can talk about both of these things. Um, but in terms of how I, I hoped I would uh, contribute to, uh, to this discussion and to this panel is by taking up uh, this notion of illiberalism in, in Eastern Europe, um, which is a phenomenon that much is written about. I think a few days ago there was an, a new article by Ivan Krastev in Foreign Affairs, which was called something like Eastern Europe Illiberal Revolution, uh, and outlining many, many of the reasons for this. But uh, my main kind of, uh, what I would want to try and do in this couple of minutes is to problematize the usual explanation for this, uh, which is uh, if you look at <coughs> main outlets, you know, academic outlets like the Journal for Democracy, Journal of Democracy, um, 
uh, the conventional explanation for why. So if we're describing a crisis which is present everywhere, you know, there's Trump and, and all of that. So there's clearly a, like um, a broader crisis that we're talking about in uh, enlightenment values, as was just now mentioned. But the, the conventional story goes that, you know, in Eastern Europe, it's way, way worse uh, because obviously these people are in government. You know, they're ruling. They have a chance to um, implement their policies. And what does this do to? Well, usually it's about, it's a, you know, one of these articles says, there are so many societal bastions of illiberalism. You have the economic nomenclatura, you know, you have the corrupt elites, uh, you have um, 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 social conservatism, you have the legacy of nationalism. So there are all many, it's almost, you know, Orban as the overdetermined outcome, almost, right? Uh, everything going against, in a sense, right? That's, that's the generally uh, how it's described. And there's quite a lot of, um, you know, there's an Orientalist um, element to this where it's basically these are backward societies, you know, they were like drawn towards Europe through the process of European integration, but, you know, once they came in, and now we have Croatia as the least, uh, as the newest example, you know, once they come in, then, you know, everything lets loose, again, all of these, you know, illiberal uh, bastions, you know. But what I think, you know, what, what I think we should consider here is, you know, the political process that led to what we are uh, um, witnessing today is one in which uh, the horizon of what was promised was social Europe, you know, that was the, the golden era uh, of the second half of the 20th century, where you'll have welfare state, you know, the tamed version of capitalism where uh, people will have basic decency, you know, uh, and, l and conditions of life with more liberty of every kind, right? That's, that's kind of the, the project at, as it was um, uh, described, but actually what it, what it was implemented as was, I would argue, you know, kind of this pure, undiluted, you know, served up as a pure, undiluted liberal project, which is in the, in the political sphere, it's rule of law, checks and balances, in the, in the economic sphere, it's the neoliberal package, you know, privatize, deregulate, liberalize across the board. And, you know, you would wonder, you know, why is this a problem? Well, I would argue that's a problem because liberalism as an ideology cannot either build nor sustain communities. It has to be grafted onto some kind of idea of society. And this was completely eviscerated uh, from these societies in the last 20 years. And I think this is, I can say, you know, with most kind of conviction that this would be true for Croatia, but I would argue that this is a state uh, we can describe uh, for, you know, many post-socialist societies. Um, so, you know, it was, I would argue that because this was so unpalatable, to swallow, uh, is this was the, the, the kind of the project of European integration was also pictured as, um, you know, this is where we belong. This is where um, it was equated with progress, with being modern. Um, and when, you know, all of these narratives are not followed up with real material improvements of life for many, um, then, you know, uh, kind of the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. I don't think we should be so surprised that um, the aftermath of um, the process of European integration has brought uh, with itself uh, this pushback. Um, because a lot of the discourse that was produced was um, based on this antagonism where you have Europe as is the, mod the modernist project, you know, uh, orientation towards the future, while everything that's local um, is backward. And I think this is something that we really, really must fight. And, and you know, to kind of conclude, um, politically speaking, um, uh, we need, you know, in order to fix Europe from this kind of peripheral perspective, we really need to turn back to kind of um, grassroots uh, and municipal uh, political organizing to develop kind of democratic learning, but also really fight um, uh, this uh, cleavage according to which uh, what is local and what is, um, you know, to be Croat is to be backward and to be European is to be forward, so to speak. Okay? That's where would I leave. Well, you know, uh, I feel that uh, the question whether Europe is in crisis and uh, whether it should be <laughs> even uh, in crisis is too big for me, but I am helped by this identification between Europe and the European Union and certainly the European Union is in crisis, so I will address the question this way. I'll talk the European Union. Although I think that uh, it would be interesting to retrieve a wider 
concept of Europe. Uh, and uh, I feel that the other question, uh, the dichotomy liberal-illiberal, uh, better fits the European Union uh, framework as uh, our friend Macron now uh, uh, so uh, concisely uh, puts it. You know, if you want to uh, refuse the winning narrative, the winning narrative is that we are in a market democracy and there is nothing alternative and different if you want a democratic uh, society, okay? You associate market and democracy as two factors which go together, okay? You can't have democracy without the market. So being liberal, you know, there is another uh, 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 detail that uh, I'd love to uh, here point out. Everybody says I'm liberal. Nobody says I'm illiberal. So, you know, I mean, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, crucial for us to understand. Illiberal, you always use of someone else. Hmm? While liberal, you can use... Uh, well, uh, you know, but uh, even, uh, even if you are, I mean, uh, you, you will uh, use uh, some euphemism to say, look, I mean, I'm uh, critical of liberalism as we understand it in uh, a more Western uh, uh, take on Europe. You know, so if you want to re refuse liberalism now, you have to refuse the lot. And this is happening in Europe, you know, this is happening. You have big protest publics that then crystallize into political forces. They refuse the neoliberal take on economy. So they bring a somehow old leftist economic program and they refuse also the other side of liberalism. For instance, xenophobia goes now in many countries together with an economic left program, okay, a leftist economic program. And uh, this is true in Italy, you have the Five Star Movement, uh, they got more than 30% of the votes, they have a heavily leftist, a radical leftist, uh, you know, I remember 12 years ago I was in this European network of the minimum uh, guaranteed income and we were basically anarchists. By now you have a populist, this is another term that you always use for someone else, a populist movement in Italy that has uh, uh, that as a priority, uh, you know, point for them and of course uh, they play with someone else, uh, something else which is xenophobia because that's good for, uh, you know, uh, your votes. So uh, uh, I would say if we talk uh, the European Union, less, uh, yes, it is uh, in crisis. Uh, yes, it should now uh, get to another crisis. And uh, yes, uh, we should uh, revise uh, the term illiberal and perhaps uh, decline it into uh, different uh, uh, forms that are more useful to understand why liberalism is not the only alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. So, Ursula. Well, I generally, when Vidan started, I thought it's my turn tonight to be optimistic because I grew up all my life in accordance with the Treaty of Rome and I enjoyed all the benefits of this mm -hmm. initial idea of uh, Europe and economic and social developments. And I remember those days in. 86, Spain and Portugal joined, and in those days I was a co-worker in the alliance of the progressives and democrats, they are called today like this, and I remember this huge kind of optimism, but the last time that I remembered such a level of optimism, and today, nowadays, Orban, Kaczynski, and, and many, many others, in my opinion, they are just the symptoms of a problem. They are not the problem, just but the symptoms. And what I realized with these being posted around Europe and other countries is this growing inequality and people are getting more and more frustrated on different levels, of course. If we are talking about inequality in Serbia, it's quite different to talking about inequality in Germany. But uh, nevertheless, frustration has roots that we can, I guess, 
compare. Of course, you quoted uh, Robert Schumann, what is per yeah, this one of the elements of Europe is this permanent crisis, otherwise it won't function. But uh, in those days, uh, just after the Second World War, on this total destruction, just of institutions, of infrastructure, mentalities, I guess he was right to mention this. Nowadays we have to find answers and uh, maybe some of colleagues tonight know that in my home country we had some problems in forming a new government and uh, finally, well now I guess we have one when we prepared some of, for and some of us were involved in preparing papers for these working groups and we discussed about the region, Western Balkans, and I remember in 2013, I was far away from here, but the coalition agreement didn't mention the region, not at all. This time uh, we have at least half a sentence, or let's say a short sentence, to open or the, as a window of opportunity for the region and aspiring countries like Serbia, Montenegro, Macedonia, and all the others. Therefore, it's a small step and it let me put it, that's maybe a window of opportunity for those who are really inter interested, and I agree with some of my colleagues, uh, change always starts at home or maybe on the local level. Mm -hmm. It will take some time, and of course, I admit that next year in May, in the member states, we will people will vote for a new parliament, and the composition of the parliament would I hope I'm not too pessimistic, would look very different to the one we have nowadays. And even the European Commission, maybe some three or four countries with a progressive government. Let's imagine then 23 members of the European Commissions being either neoliberal, conservative, or very s you're skeptical. Therefore, it's time to hurry on. If you allow me, uh, I want uh, a little bit to change the approach of our discussion. I'm starting with the introduction of Vedran uh, because he was speaking about crisis and also everybody speaking here mentions the word crisis. I'm a fan to listen to the language. Crisis is a world which is coming out of the old Greek language. It's coming from Krino and Krino means, means to judge and to decide. May I say all these crises in which we are is not leading to the uh, result that we are judging and deciding. I think we are making a lot of noise around. I think it's very good that we have think tanks a lot. They are producing a lot of papers. I have to study it. Uh, I think it's really sometimes boring and so. But what I'm really missing is do tanks. I think they are not enough do tanks. They are only think tanks having nice ideas and the next paper and discussing and so on and so on. And what do I mean by to judge and to decide? To look what Europe really, really means. Let's make a reality check under the global aspects. We are always saying we are living in the time of globalization. <laughs> Nothing in this discussion is looking to the global approach because Europe is now 7% of the global population still 20% are a little bit in the economic power, and that's it. And what is the perspective? The population of Europe will get will down because we are overaged and so on and so on, and these 20% will even go down because the Chinese are coming up, the Indians are coming up, and, and so on and so on. I think it is a shrinking importance with a challenge that we have to discuss for what is Europe standing in this context, and that's not really happening. Uh, I think we have, okay, we are speaking about uh, the ecological question and climate change and so on and so on. We are a little bit speaking about what might happen if the explosion of population in Africa will have an impact. Sometimes it's discussed, okay, they will come all through Libya and cross the Mediterranean Sea and so on and so on, but nobody is considering it. What does it mean? We are all deeply impressed in Italy that uh, a lot of uh, black people are selling everything on the roads and they are coming and uh, arriving at islands and so on and so on. But this discussion is not really happening. I think what we are discussing is extremely backwards. 
uh, and are problems which are really not so important as the general problems for sure existing. In all my deep respect to Macron, uh, but the solution may be, let's make a Europe with two velocities and so on and so on, is not the solution. I think the real question is, how is Europe really to do? Because even I may say, and I'm involved uh, by my age in a very long time about this discussion, I think we are not really uh, agreeing which kind of Europe do we mean. Is Europe the European Union? For sure, not at all. Is Europe like the definition of the continent? Also, I think a lot of questions. Even the influences of Europe are going further on, but the influences are coming also uh, from the other side. I think aside a little bit discussions, the Chinese are appearing here in the region. Huh? They are improving the railway between Athens, uh, Belgrade, and Budapest, and so on and so on. But there's no real discussion. We are still discussing what are we doing with the IPA money and uh, about enlargement and so on and so on. I think the real situation for this Europe, shrinking Europe, would be necessary not to discuss the enlargement of the European Union. Let's take what is left. Let's take the whole Balkans because we need it. What will we do if they are coming from Libya, if they are coming from Near East? what they are doing in the reality. These are the real questions. We are without any answer what is happening in Syria. Huh? I think Europe is totally quiet. Also, it's this region where the danger <laughs> that it has an impact on this region is quite a big one. Uh, if you are looking to the figures of, of migrants and so on and so on. So far, I think we have to a little bit to change the approach of the discussion. Maybe sometimes it's necessary, and here I'm touching France, and uh, our beloved Macron, I think we need a certain kind of enlightenment. I think what we are really missing is a reality check and uh, what to do with this reality. We are approaching a lot of other discussions. It's extremely nice and we can make uh, a lot of uh, meetings and so on and so on. But the real challenge, what to do with Europe, for what is Europe standing, I think this we have to meet really. Uh, and I think here we have to do some contribution by our experience out of history of science and, 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 and. It's for sure a long story and we can do contributions. But are we really prepared to do this constitution? We are not evil, even able uh, to, to, to check Donald Trump. I think I'm a fan of Donald Trump. Why? Because he is giving a kick in the ass of the Europeans, saying you, are no, uh, you have no importance and you have to stand for yourself. Are we doing this? I think that's for sure quite necessary. So far, I'm other way around a fan of, of, of Donald Trump for sure, but I think it is a real challenge happening so far. Also democracy was mentioned, liberal democracy, illiberal democracy, and so on and so on. But on the other side, if I'm going through Europe, there's some admiration for other forms. An admiration for Putin, for sure, Russia is no democracy, but he's able to make decisions. He's showing to be powerful. Huh? Uh, a lot of are commenting this, not having the idea that they want to be again communists or something like that. That's not for sure true. There's uh, some admiration for the Chinese. Ah, the Chinese managed to have one party system, but they are very successful in the economy. Huh? Uh, there's also a certain impact. Uh, this question we are not really discussing. So far, I think it's quite necessary in the sense of the word crisis to do a reality check and to judge and to decide what we are doing on this question. I think let's change the subjects. We should forget a lot of the discussion we have on the wrong issues. For sure, it's nice to do it. Uh, I like discussions. I did it for all my lifetime. Uh, but we are in a critical situation where the question is in which direction is Europe really moving and what can we mobilize and where are we going? Because still, and uh, I want to close with a positive remark, I think we have still a lot of possibilities. Uh, but the question to ourselves is, are we using it in the, in the right direction? Are we checking what we really can do as the Europeans? And I think you can answer the question for yourself. Thank you. And. Uh, Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go back actually, not just in uh, Vedran's uh, uh, intro with this question, but in the intros uh, to us. And uh, 
it's been a while since I heard somebody actually praise Donald Trump, but uh, I think uh, you did it the right way. Uh, but uh, the way Vedran was actually sh uh, presenting us, uh, with us being on the right side by your left, that's all it is is a perception. So that's how I see this question and, the, and my answer or my take on, the, on this question on the crisis and uh, the EU friends and the EU enemies, uh, whether that's uh, within the EU or this region, the Southeastern Europe. Um, perception for a lot of people is reality. Uh, just ask anybody from, uh, from Hungary or Poland or any of the other countries within the EU. Ask any of the Americans that have voted for Trump and uh, you know, are still supporting him. Uh, do you think that the Orban supporters feel oppressed? Do you feel that, do you think that, uh, that those people there, the citizens in, uh, in Hungary, feel like they have to flee their country just because somebody said that, it, they're, that Viktor Orban is this uh, dictator-like uh, uh, leader of their country? So perception for a lot of, for a lot of us is reality, um, and change will come sooner or later. Change will come. Uh, sometimes it will be a modified form of a, of a change. Uh, for a lot of people in this region, uh, that change uh, is happening uh, with people running, uh, running away from these authoritarian regimes. Uh, we have a lot of the youth, and not just the youth, leaving these countries and fleeing towards the countries that don't have this, these kind of regimes. They don't have these uh, Euroskeptic uh, uh, governments. They don't have these uh, uh, cases where uh, uh, they don't feel welcome. So of course, I mean, maybe we cannot say that for Germany, for an example. A lot of people are going to Germany, but you know, we also have their uh, a rise uh, of a party that is uh, not so democratic. Uh, so maybe. Uh, we cannot generalize all this, but you know, again, perception is the reality. So with, uh, if you ask, I, I'm coming from Macedonia. If you ask three years ago, three, four years ago, any of the citizens of Macedonia, do you feel like that Nikola Grevsky as a prime minister of Macedonia is leading the country in the right way? I would say a lot of the people would, will tell you, well, sure. Even some of the uh, supporters of the opposition will tell you, well, you know what? He raised the level of the wages. He, you know, he employed a lot of people. Well, he employed a lot of people in the government. So the f there were different kinds of clientelism that was that were taking shape. A lot of these leaders uh, that are perceived as dictators uh, are kind of doing a lot of copycatting, a lot of copy paste. So they're using the political or the party clientelism to their advantage. They're showing a lot of support. They're substituting what the market economy should be doing with what the government or the political party is actually doing. So change will happen. I mean, even here, one of our fellow pa panelists actually mentioned that uh, in some of the cases that the left or the progressive left is taking on xenophobia. In my opinion, I think the xenophobics are using the populist leftist economic, economic models in order to get, you know, to be more attractive. So kind of like, and I'm not here to bash IFD or anything like that, I'll turn this for Deutschland, but uh, if you talk to any of, the, any of their uh, functionaries, which I've had the pleasure to do so, you're not gonna hear the xenophobia in their talk. You're gonna hear that he likes his country and he wishes that the foreigners that are coming in his country will also like their country, their own country, the same way he likes or he or she likes his. They're talking about the economic models that are progressive, you know, of course. So that's why my perception is different. I don't think that the progressive left is taking on the xenophobic um, uh, characteristics or so. So I think altogether, I think we have to realize and we have to, uh, we have to stop underestimating the the people that are following these regimes, we have to, we have to, uh, we have to take in, a, in, in account how can we actually open up these avenues of communication, how we can open up and this free consult consultative process, 
kind of like what you, you just said. I think we have to listen more. We, we, we probably need to talk more with the people that are different than us. And then we have to react because just listening and, and just talking and no reaction to it with, I would say, with no compromises. So only then the perception and the reality will be equal. It wouldn't be just my perception or your perception or, or their perception on the other side of this panel, which is left or the far left over there. So I consider myself leftist. So I think at the end of it, 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 will, it, it will not matter which side I'm sitting on. Thank you, Milan. Uh, uh, we still have some time, and, and, and I want to pose a, a, a quick second question. Uh, so recently, uh, not, not so recently, I mean Sigmund Baumann died uh, recently, and, and he published a, just a small booklet with an Italian journalist, which is nice, but prior to that one, he published a book called Retrotopia, where he argued that uh, increasingly, in Europe, uh, regimes and politicians and, and even movements are seeking the answers for the problems of the future in the past, building retrotopian societies. Agnes Heller, I believe she was, was she giving a lecture at the Institute uh, for Philosophy? Not yet, but sh sh she should. So Agnes, Agnes Heller uh, 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 published a small booklet on dystopian societies, uh, speaking about Europe as right now as, as a dystopia. Uh, and a Dutch a wunderkind uh, called Rutger Bregman, uh, you know, usually we have to be aware of these wunderkinds and askets and, and guys that not sleep, don't sleep and that are too, too intelligent. Uh, and we have some in this country, but anyway, uh, Rutger Bregman published a book uh, uh, called uh, Quest for Real Utopia, something. And, 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 and in that book, he has a sentence uh, telling like conflicting utopias are the lifeblood of democracies. Now, now I bring it back to Europe. Uh, as when we have the, the, the take the notion of Europe of today, uh, uh, the first question will be just a quick one. Is this a retrotopian, dystopian, or a kind of a utopian uh, uh, vision of Europe that we have right now? And the second one, and this brings me to, to, to issues of social justice, of, of, of uh, grassroots movements, of, of, of resistance in Macedonia, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 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 are we, uh, or what will be uh, uh, if, we, if we agree that, that conflicting utopias are the lifeblood of democracies? And if we agree that we want to have a free, democratic, uh, uh, open uh, Europe, what will be like the basic ingredients that we would need today and to think about today in order to, uh, to reach this kind of real utopia? Uh, is it tackle the social question in a new way? Uh, ask the question, how, what, which kind of urgent action do we need? As Petra tries to answer right now, right now, uh, or uh, grassroots movements, or, uh, or or mobilization beyond populism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, and, and I would also, I mean, like in the first round, I'd like to start. I like to start on the right, left, <laughs> on far left. Thank you. Well. Just yesterday, I watched an interview with uh, Andre Nikolaidis, a writer and columnist from Montenegro, and um, he said something that, I, when asked about, uh, he was asked a similar question about utopian future, how his generation imagines future, and he said, our problem is that our desired future is in the past, that's what happened. And it's, it's a topic that has been talked about a lot, especially uh, with regard to left, yeah, on the left, radical left, that it's uh, this uh, uh, inability to 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 mourn the past, you know, and it's inability to just break away from the past. And we also know in the, this region, you nostalgia is a big topic. You nostalgia, not just um, nostalgic look to the past, but uh, empowering way of criticizing the present. But we just don't know what to do with this. Okay, we are critiquing. We, we're not just looking to the past. We want to do something progressive, something future oriented with it, but we don't know actually what to do with it. And we just get locked in this past. And in a funny way, it actually connects. I mean, I find this connected to what was just last said about how we need to listen more, how we need to do more. 
Uh, we need to, to understand why people make choices that they do, why people vote. And that's a great question, but it's, it begs another question. Who? Who should listen to people? Like who? Uh, think tanks, do tanks, uh, academic institutions, stiftungs, institutions. So this is really the major problem because we, we, we should listen to people, but how can people's voices and desires and understanding, how can, get, how can get they get through to political institutions? Because that is one of the core problems. People, uh, people feel excluded from political institutions. And when we say that we need to listen to them more, we need to also uh, find a way of doing something with that material, right? So when we listen to them and we, when, we, when we finally, maybe when we understand if that's even possible, so what do we do with it? And it's in a strange way, it is connected with this issue of, of, of future. Now we live, are we living a retrotopia, dystopia, utopia? I don't really know. We are living in the present. This is the present that we have. Um, a friend of mine, dear friend of mine, just yesterday reminded me of a wonderful line from Joe Strummer, future is unwritten, yeah, that's true, F future is unwritten, and that's, uh, that could be optimistic, but uh, I think that, 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 I won't say left, but progressive, progressive, uh, uh, progressive forces should uh, also think about this morning from the past. They should also think about what was this golden age of Europe that, that Daniela mentioned, and we should think how to, what to do with it today, and why, why is it that it is destroyed today? Was it something, was, was, there, was there something in it that was sort of meant to, meant for destruction? Was there, was there a seed in that that kind of led to the situation which we are today? And if we really do, if we intuitively feel that we need to connect more to people, then we need to, this, to try to translate this intuition into a political action. You know? And that's why I think that some kind of new political organization, uh, municipal, local political organization, when people voices and, and people real needs should be translated into political actions and should be built into some kind of new political institutions. We shouldn't just be satisfied with finding out what people want. We should politicize that and, and strive for, for some political, for new political visions. Thank you, Elena. Hans Jörg. Yes, you raised a big question in the second round and asked us at the same time to be short. This is a kind of challenge, but you mentioned uh, Sigmund Bauman uh, with this idea of utopia. Sigmund Bauman, he also had a nice metaphor about Europe. He said that Europe is an adventure. Uh, Europe is a journey. It is not something where you stay, uh, which you define as heimat, but it is a kind of departure. It's a collective departure towards something that is unknown. And this is indeed a kind of recurrent metaphor in the history of Europe also, that Europe was always identified as a kind of departure. You can start with the old Greek myth of uh, Zeus and the, uh, uh, the uh, it's a kind of adventurous uh, travel, the crusaders um, and so forth and so forth. And um, if um, I apply this now uh, to the current situation, uh, looking back uh, is actually not typical European. Uh, looking back at the past. Uh, Europe is forward-looking. Uh, the whole idea of Europe uh, has to do with forward-looking. Looking back is something that nationalism can do much better. And also with regard to utopias and visions, I would say that also nationalism is better in developing utopias or visions. And the idea of Europe and of the European integration in particular was actually indeed to be more dystopia than utopia, to be non-visionary, to overcome these visions of the past, uh, of nationalism, and the kind of tragic consequences uh, these led into. So um, Europe is a bad uh, kind of uh, visionary uh, actor and uh, bad uh, to kind of defend and develop utopias. The, um, uh, the European Union has always been bad to do this, and uh, they have opted for a, a more pragmatic approach. Uh, there are, there are these all these Brussels functionaries, they are a little bit like Helmut Schmidt, uh, the, uh, the former German chancellor, who said that who has visions needs to see a doctor. <laughs> and um, this is a little bit uh, the uh, approach of the European Union, which is very pragmatic. And um, being pragmatic, uh, they can still be progressive. Uh, 
And here I come back a little bit also to what you were mentioning here, what it means actually to be progressive uh, in this world. And I would say being progressive in this world means to stand for a common good, for, for a common good beyond particular interests. And if you take this seriously, then disintegration, for instance, is not an option. And also renationalization is not an option because um, the challenges uh, that we meet then is that they do not stand for a common good beyond uh, the particular interests. And if the European Union does just this in a very pragmatic way, I think this is uh, sufficient. Okay, this sounds sometimes like a quiz, you know, <laughs> seven <laughs> answers to one question. Uh, right, so uh, I would say that uh, being oriented to the past is not a problem for all political forces, as was already mentioned, but for the left, because the left used to be about, um, you know, emancipation and social change and progress and the future. And it's, it's the particular malaise of the left to be nostalgic because it becomes reactionary, because it becomes about defending the status quo, meaning, you know, if you're living to, uh, through 20 years of welfare state retrenchment, then you're struggling and you're, you know, investing your energy, political, social, and otherwise, to defend rights which were fought for before. And that's where, you know, but how we got there, I mean, to a large extent, because what is usually called the left, which is social democracy in, in Europe, gave up. It basically told us that uh, the market forces are inevitable and unstoppable, and that the social program is a, is a palliative program. But those, you know, wounded by the market will kind of compensate them in some way. But it's a bitter pill everybody has to swallow. And it's been telling that to its voters for so long that it lost the voters. Um, and what happened in, you know, over... O, o, you know, all of a sudden, everybody's, um, you know, so surprised that we have what, you know, Pippa Norris called the enemy within. Who was the voter who voted for, you know, Trump and people like that? And then these, you know, false dichotomies, oh, is it because people feel economically insecure? No, it can't be because too many uh, middle class voters vote for them. It must be an authoritarian personality and all these kind of, you know, strange um, constructions where, uh, obviously, what's been going on is that for a very long time, the so broadly, of course, we can say there's been a, tr a, 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 a trend of growing economic inequality, which is the, the ills of which, the uh, narrative of how it happened has been captured by the right. And it's been, you know, completely um, pictured into this enemy, which is sometimes within. Uh, if you know, it can be LGBT people, it can be ethnic minorities, or so on. In uh, uh, ethnically homogeneous societies like Croatia, you know, we have to invent these kind of internal enemies. We don't have any migrants, uh, or very few. But in other countries where you have s uh, high percentages of migrants, you, you have them to blame, right? And so this is where um, it comes from. I, I think that a lot of the left just abdicated or, of trying to uh, argue that we can have a different future. And that's why I agree completely with, you know, what Yelena was saying. We really need to, and that's what politically I've been trying to do, talk to people and, you know, not start from, oh, this is not my voter because this is some, you know, chauvinist person who votes for the right, but, like, talk to them and uh, see if you can, uh, out of their common sense, as we heard from Steph uh, uh, this morning, you know, use something to develop a, a good sense. Yes, uh, what is common in uh, retrotopia, uh, dystopia, which is a different place, and utopia, which is a place which is not, is that it is not this topia. We should understand why we are rejecting topia, the present, and I think it is uh, evident uh, that uh, we reject it because we feel uneasy with it. And in fact, we feel not part of it. We feel part of that 90% odds of Europeans that are in some extopia that feel excluded from the real thing. The real thing is not democratic representation because whenever we vote, they give it back to us as, oh, you know, uh, Ireland, uh, someone uh, is talking uh, the European Constitution. You remember Ireland? They made it vote twice because the first time they didn't give the correct answer, you know. So, uh, of course, of course, you feel out of it. 
and you reject this topia and you look for something else. The left looks back. I would look forward, but I have no idea. Certainly, no <laughs> left nor right. You know, this is the point. You know, we should try and understand then that this is not about being progressive. You know, being for the common good when 90% of people doesn't feel that politics are doing that is a revolutionary stand that you are taking. It is a revolutionary stand. Being for the common good today in Europe means, first of all, try and have forms of democratic participation, real democratic participation, that are not facilitated, you know, by Brussels, by central governments, you know. They are, the elites are all happy, you know, with this situation. While we, the people, you know, are getting the wrong side of it, you know. This simplification of the political discourse is out of self-defense by now. You can decide that all poor, they don't understand, or you can play with it, you know. And it, it is the only way forward, you know, being revolutionary, trying to have forms of uh, protest, but also of construction of new legality in Europe beyond democratic rep uh, representativeness. Well, the topic for the next conference. <laughs> Sometimes when it's raining in Belgrade or really cold, I at home start my satellite dish and then take 15 minutes of one of the German talk shows. And then, of course, after fi 15 minutes, I hope that it won't rain for the next three months, at least. And my impression is that, that we are copying one of these talk shows now a bit. Because uh, therefore, my argument is, for maybe starting a debate, is let's start from the daily life of an ordinary European citizen. And next, um, maybe I can't talk about an ordinary European citizen, but because I'm a German, uh, for more than a decade, a majority of our people is voting for a candidate and her main message is, don't worry, I care for you. And 30, 40, sometimes more people are fine with this attitude. And why? I won't criticize them because they are busy with their children, with their jobs, or finding a new jobs, or in different ways making ends meet, and they are, of course, there are these perceptions of different kinds of threat, talking about cyber crime, talking about Islamic State, Turkey, Syria, Russia, and many, many others. Therefore, there is the per perception of, of the people, we have some economic difficulties, uh, politicians are always talking in talk shows about threats, Therefore, thanks God, but don't hunt for any kind of utopia. And therefore, yes, of course, I know this quote, Helmut Schmidt's quote, but I guess many, many people would love to follow today Karl Popper more than any philosopher. And uh, the other argument is uh, what kind and what level of civic activism do we have? Whenever I'm trying to learn what's going on at home, the level of activism, civic activism, is very high. But in local context, in regional context, or one-issue movements, and the idea of getting involved or being involved in political civic engagement is very low. And those who are involved in evenings and weekends activities when we are talking about political parties, they are mainly of my age or older, which is a big problem, of course. And of course, on the other hand, we have these European pulse gatherings in the bigger cities, 
there the participants are young, but can these 2,000 people on a Saturday in the center of our capital really make a difference? Uh, many thanks for your comment. I think I can really continue. Uh, I think we have to be aware about the feelings uh, of the different citizens concerning the situation, because without any doubt, we developed a society, we de developed a way of life, we developed a way of organization, which is really complex and very difficult to understand. I think one of the main problems we have that there is a lot of anxiety as a citizen, having the feeling there's insecurity. We don't know what is really coming. How can I defend myself? Uh, and there's not too much trust uh, on the institutions of the state or whatever the organizations are and so on and so on. And having been for a very long time uh, part of the system, I understand it on the other side. Uh, because I think those who are in charge, uh, our minister, it is not so secure what we're really doing and we, we are not really w well aware about uh, what is here done. I think here we have to consider uh, that this anxiety is more and more because the possibilities are increasing and uh, that has some reactions. There's a very nice say sentence in my home city, Vienna, uh, where it's always said, Everybody is thinking on him or herself, only me, I'm thinking on myself. And I think that's the basics of our populism. Huh? I'm thinking on myself. Nobody else is doing it. Huh? And you have a collection of millions of those, nobody else is doing it for me. Uh, and this is creating a, a certain approach here uh, without any doubt. Uh, and here you have to look to the language which is really chosen. Uh, I'm the contrary of a fan of Donald Trump, but it is a primitive language. Who has the bigger button to push? Huh? That's a clear language. Everybody's understanding. He has the bigger button to push for the atomic bomb uh, and so on and so on. Understandable. Huh? Uh, we are even here, beg your pardon, using a language which is not so understandable. Utopia, dystopia, and so on and so on. Puh. Uh, I think uh, the whole language used really also by the medias is not very understandable. And as a former politician, I may confess, we are using sometimes a language that we are not understood. It's a real aim of our language not to be understood because it's giving the impression we are clever, we know everything, but what is the real content of it, that's not really shown. Uh, and that's a problem of our democracy for sure. That's a problem of referenda, for example. Uh, I think very difficult to decide on a referendum. Uh, here, you need a grown-up democracy like the Swiss. I'm always admiring the Swiss concerning their referendums, their decisions they are doing are extremely reasonable, but they are training it for centuries. And I think we are missing this training for centuries uh, on, on this subject, knowing what's really uh, going on. Uh, Dear friends, we have a problem of the language. The language which we are using is not so easy to understand because of the other side, by science and so on and so on, we developed a language uh, which is expressing a lot of things which are not really understood. I think here we have to look and let's look what has to be really done. Are we able to simplify the language but it should be correct uh, here existing? That's uh, the problem of the Twitters of Trump. Huh? I think obviously he is considering a night long which primitive expression he can do, uh, and it is understandable. All over the world, everybody is understanding. Have you ever understood messages of the European Council? Uh, I was always deeply impressed that it was said, okay, I think now by internet you can look to the Lisbon Treaty and everybody can read it. Are you sure that you are understanding the Lisbon Treaty? I think uh, the bigger part, uh, I did not really understand that that was very much involved also in these things uh, here. We have, we have a problem for democracy. I think we have to work on the subject that it is really understood. The consequence is quite clear. We are looking to those people who are making the things more primitive, uh, that we know what's really going on. Uh, 
and where we can follow and where we feel protected and so on and so on. I think uh, you have to look to the facts that uh, the challenge for security is appearing. I think it shocks me really, first of all, we in every uh, government, in every political decision, we need more police. The number of policemen is increasing uh, all over Europe, for example. Huh? Uh, security, I'm not quite sure. If more policemen have something to shoot, I feel don't feel secure. Maybe they are using it uh, at a certain time. Are we aware of the fact that the production of weapons is increasing? Uh, I think in all my friendship to my German uh, colleagues and neighbors, they are earning a lot of money by selling weapons. Uh, they are not only selling stability and so on and so on, they are also selling this in direction for sure, security for working places uh, and, and, and. Uh, even I think uh, our dear Greek friends suffered a lot because they got a lot of money by the European Union that they can pay for the submarines and so on and so on. Uh, I don't want to blame the German government. It is a general problem. I'm only showing the example which was sure existing. And here we have to, to change a little bit the approach uh, of the discussion, I think, uh, to ask for how can we mutually be understood? And what are the really problems uh, here to define? Here we are in a crucial point, I think. We have every chance as possible to do it if we are going here in the right direction. Uh, we are doing it even more every day more complex and not very straight. Maybe it has to be outspoken. If I'm looking to my beloved region here, Southeast Europe, I think we should be outspoken. I think it is a collection of lies. I'll give you one example. I'm not a fan that Turkey should become a member of the European Union. Is it clearly expressed to them? No. We are saying maybe we are doing negotiations, we have to look to other chapters, let's open it, and, and so on and so on. Uh, I think for sure the reaction of Erdogan is a very primitive one. I don't need the European Union. I think he is clear. We are not clear. It's only one example. I can give you a lot of examples in this direction. And I think for this we have to fight uh, here to get a clearer language. The language which we are using is not a very clear one. It is a very complex one uh, here existing. And so for those who are very primitive, expressing straight things, uh, uh, are better understood, but they are also more dangerous. And I think in this direction we have to look. Uh, simplification is also a danger. Uh, but we have to introduce, as I remarked at the beginning of my, my first statement, uh, to distinct to judge and to decide, I think, to make differentiation here, which is a difficult job. So far, I think the real priority of our development in Europe, we have to do more for education, common education, not a complex one for sure, that's working. I think uh, it will be invented in favor of the technology of the business development and so on and so on. I think it is a question of uh, education uh, in the common sense of understanding in which world we are living and what the real instruments uh, here are. And I think our side of the panel, uh, the, left side, the left side, you know, looking from your side is, uh, is agreeing, actually uh, following up on each other. And I think, uh, Vedran, now I, I, will I will follow up on what you said about the language and the complexity and the simplicity. Uh, I think Vedran remembers that in one of our uh, civil society forums, I think uh, we had uh, one of your colleagues, Bebek colleagues, which is now a Minister of Foreign Affairs, he actually said that one of the tendencies of a regime is uh, solving complex problems with simple solutions. So I think we've seen that uh, in some of these countries where we, we do have the autocratic regimes. We've seen it that uh, exactly as you had said, uh, uh, as Donald Trump, he's tweeting the solutions, he's tweeting his executive orders, and he's using a simple language that is reaching out really far. So I'm not a, uh, I'm not a fan of uh, uh, you know, finding a blueprint, okay, now we have to find a simple uh, or simplified uh, uh, lexicon and then let's start using it. As you said, we need to, actually look more into it. Uh, these uh, simple solutions in the beginning, you know, they might seem as the, as the right ones. Uh, 
but I think uh, this is just only one of the points that uh, that I will give, uh, one of the three points that I will give uh, on my take on this question uh, on the topias. Uh, in terms of Europe and in terms of um, which way is the right way? Uh, are we seeing more of the utopian or the dystopian uh, supporters or whatnot? I think uh, we've heard a couple of times that uh, that the future of Europe is will be good uh, as long as there is a high level of sustainability of the driving structure within the EU, which now it's uh, Berlin and Paris. Uh, sometimes that can be a dangerous thing. You know, th these are the things that. Uh, uh, are kind of scaring a lot of people within the EU and as myself, you know, living in a country that's outside of the EU, the European Union right now, uh, it can only mean just one thing. Okay, what if there is a tipping of the scales? Uh, again, not to mention Donald Trump again, but we've s we saw what happened in the United States with that tipping of the scales and a lot of, you know, a lot of comments were, were made about you know, who are the ones voting for, uh, for Trump? You know, who are those that are, uh, you know, following his, his, his lead? Well, as long as there's this uh, general sense of uh, monopolizing of the terms within our societies, whether that's in the countries within the European Union or the ones outside in the WB6, for an example, uh, or Turkey, for, uh, and what I mean by monopolization of the terms is like, you know, uh, a, a lot of us feel like we have the monopoly of the progressive forces, progressive actors, uh, democracy, uh, or in the same time, you know, some of, some of them, let's just put them in quote unquote them, they might have the, you know, they might feel like they, they have the, the, the monopoly on uh, autocracy, you know. Uh, or regime, or uh, clientelism, so things like that. Uh, I think we need to just kind of look within ourselves and say, okay, well, what is 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 the general problem? Uh, let's just uh, and let's just pick Serbia for an example. Uh, it is my understanding that really, in terms of the political sense, political party sense, really, if you look at you know what the political parties from the left spectrum are doing. Can we really identify any of the political parties in Serbia as leftist or even social democrats? Let's not even go to the far left. Uh, but then you have a lot of movements. You know, you have you know I have friends that are here. Uh, they are part of the, the, the uh, some of these leftist movements. But are they are are they trying to uh, monopolize the left or the term as left? And is that doing them a favor in the general sense of things? Are those, are, is the other side that is using a lot of these simple terms, a lot of simplified language, are they winning in this, in this fight for freedom, for, for regime change, and hopefully this is not going on national TV because I do need to leave the country, you know, in the next day or two. But uh, uh, we need to definitely build these fronts. And, and again, you know, I, I'm using the same kind of language, progressive forces, democracy, functional democracy, but I'll give a, I'll give a very, uh, I would say, very simple uh, comparison. I work for the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung for the Skopje office. There's a Konrad Adenauer Stiftung office in, in Skopje, and if you look at the, uh, if you look at our program or what we do and what, we, what are our goals and uh, our aims, you will see that we're fighting or we're all, we're all aiming for building a functional democracy, helping the countries that we're in as a, as a foundation, as foundations to build a functional democracy within these societies. And of course, we're taking different kind of political ideology in the process, but our aim is that. So this is very simplified uh, way of putting it, putting it out. But you know, there's not one blueprint that will say it will work here, so it's gonna work in Serbia as well. Take Macedonia for an example. It, it took a while. It took a while. Turkey was mentioned as well. So, should we just stop or you know break this this uh, this cord that is connecting Turkey and, and the European Union? Should there be hope? Uh, well, hopefully there is hope in all of us. But you know, there's a book that says hope is not a strategy. So we need to strategically decide what our aims are going to be and our by us 
really sticking to our terms? Are we alienating a lot of things, a lot of people and a lot of supporters in this entire process? Thank you, Milania. There is hope in all of us. And there are uh, questions usually in, in all possible debates. Uh, so I uh, would just like to include and, and to ask you to, to pose a few questions or comments. We will just collect, make a round, and then uh, make some concluding remarks on the panel. So I see one hand back there. Because uh, we witnessed a week ago how one guy won a huge majority by just focusing on one, one issue, and that is migration in Hungary. And I don't think that this issue is in important as such, but how, it, how migration influenced national identity, and Orban presented migration as a threat to national ident identity, Hungarian national identity, and won a huge majority. And I also don't think that this issue is so important and so potent only in Eastern Europe. It's very potent in Western Europe too, because for decades in Western Europe, uh, uh, identity issues were related to minority issues, but now they are also related to majority issues, because we have a clash in, in Western European societies between, on one side, civic concept of, of citizenship and on one side, on the other side, ethnic concept of citizenship, citizenship because national identity plays a major role in West Europe too. And not uh, the rise of the right-wing populists are not only, is, is not the only uh, evidence regarding that, but also that we, 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 we have also uh, other, other evidences that, that, are, that are saying that these issues are very, 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 very important. For example, uh, these tendencies that uh, conservative parties are adopting, increasingly adopting soft version of, of right-wing populism. And that, uh, that is why I don't, I'm not 100% sure that this civic notion of, of citizenship will prevail in Western Europe. If it doesn't pre prevail, then we have American, American conditions in, in, in Western Europe. Because look at the Republican Party, American Republican Party, and how they adopted this, this uh, Ethnic, ethnic discourse regarding national identity issues and how this led to the deep depolarization of, of, of American, American society and how this negatively affects uh, the whole, whole democratic system. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments, remarks? Hello to everyone. Thank you for your speeches. I'm Maya Bialish, researcher. We're for uh, one, uh, one of the Belgrade-based think tank, trying not to uh, write nice policy papers, but also do something in the field of security sector reform. Um, I was intrigued by your uh, light speeches, and I wanted to pose you two, two questions. The first would be, you mentioned several uh, alternatives. Uh, in your opinion, which of the alternatives uh, has the best chance to become mainstream? and like when in your opinion. The second one is uh, how to influence the present when political elites are really actively um, trying to change the past and behave like the future is determined. So because you like discuss about present, past and the future. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, one tiny question. For, for someone uh, among you who does not agree with the, the thesis that we should simplify our language, is there anyone among you who would fight against this assumption so that we need to be simplified, to be, I don't know, to adopt a, some kind of Trump-like vision of ourselves, especially us here, because we are, at least most of us, are academics, so in that sense, what do you think if there is anyone who would disagree with that idea? Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Up. Yes. OK, 
Okay, uh, so thank you for your speeches. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, can we be completely certain that the rise of uh, national question in Europe and in the world right now is uh, really due to the shaky uh, or crisis of uh, neoliberalism or the rise of precariat as, uh, as Bauman would uh, say? Because as we see in many researches in the United States, especially it was the rich white class which chose uh, um, Trump, uh, which obviously doesn't have the problem with the current economic state, and from my uh, minor knowledge, so it, I'm not claiming anything, uh, we see the similar processes in the uh, Czech Republic, where I don't see big economic issues, but I see the the, the victories of the of the nationalist options. So, is there one last? It's already enough. Yeah, it's already. I mean. <laughs> Everything is already enough, but it, no. Uh, let's 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 go in in uh, in, in reverse order, uh, and I, I don't believe that all of us and all of you on the panel should answer all the questions. So pick or choose uh, one or, or two, and, and put an emphasis on on on, a, on an issue that is very important to you. So this is, I mean, a lot has been opened, and so Milan, we start with you. Sure, uh, I think. To start with, uh, in terms about th the question about migration and uh, the tendencies in the region as well as uh, as well as the European Union, I think, and also there was there was another question about um, you know what is the model that we believe it will be taken or adopted or whatnot. Uh, I think those two questions are kind of related in a way. Uh, the model is democracy altogether. Uh, Orban wants by simplifying the migration issue, and that is not the answer. We shouldn't take that blueprint and oversimplify the fight for democracy. In terms of the European Union, we're seeing where the migrants are going. The migrants are not going to Hungary. I mean, they don't want to go there. They don't want to go to. Poland, in a way, even though they have had uh, economic growth, uh, but they also see what the life is. And I'll make a comparison here with the uh, with the uh, refugee route that actually s sort of entered again this the uh, Western Balkan uh, through Macedonia, through the southern part of Macedonia. A lot of the refugees, you know, go along the way. Where you know, uh, we're kind of trying to figure out why they were you know, why the Macedonian uh, citizen was so hostile against them when they said, look, we don't want to stay here. Your average salary is 350 euros. I mean, <laughs> come with us. We'll pay your tickets. I mean, these, I mean I'm not joking. This is, these are exactly the, the talks that the refugees coming from Afghanistan, coming from Syria, coming from some of them Libya, Egypt at that time, they were saying, Come on board, come on these trains, we'll go together. We'll look for a better life. They were aiming for Austria, they were aiming for Germany, they were aiming for the Scandinavian countries. So when these migrants, refugees, I mean, I don't wanna bunch them all together, they're not looking for life in Hungary. But yes, somebody there was able to win by simplifying this question. Uh, I think the message is clear what the European Union is giving to the West, six, Western Balkan six, the, the U6 countries. Fix your countries before you enter the EU. And okay, that's again, it's a simplified uh, way of putting it. But if you ask me, because we've had this survey a couple of weeks ago that uh, we said, okay, I, I, how are Macedonians feeling in, ter in terms of entering the EU? Uh, there were over 70 percent, you know, for EU, which is the largest uh, number of uh, supporters, EU supporters, within the last five years, and it's great. How how many of them saw Macedonia entering the EU from zero to 10 years? About 51 percent. And I think the realistic way of entering the EU, even tomorrow, if we solve this, you know, ridiculous name issue. Are we entering the EU right away? No, it's gonna take five to seven to eight years to harmonize the, legisl the legislative and to prove that Macedonia is becoming a better country for living. Because you know what's gonna happen if within five years we do enter the EU? 
even if we do all these checklists and things like that, these benchmarks, these chapters will open the chapters, will close the chapters, which is that's what Serbia is doing right now. If we had an exodus of over half a million Macedonians leaving the country from the period between 2003 and 2014 or 15, then we're going to have a lot more than them leaving Macedonia. They're not going to go to Hungary. They're going to go to countries such as Germany, which is already giving a lot of working visas to a lot of the people from this region. So yes, the answer is the European Union, and the answer is democracy. But this is one of the reasons why I do work for a foundation, for an organization such as, such as the one that I'm working in. Because this is, this is the first step towards building this democ democracy, functional democracy. And real quick, 30, 20 seconds, I'll give an example. For about three or four years, our office in Skopje had been functioning without a German resident representative. And we kind of felt as an office, and Orzel is an example, you know, can attest to that. We felt as an office that, you know what? We've been kind of punished for the right reasons, sort of as the Macedonian. But once we started abiding by the FES principles, and this is an internal thing for us, and once we started functioning as an office as if there was a, a German representative there, then we were rewarded in a way with somebody that is now a full-time German resident re representative for FES. So I'm comparing these processes for entering the EU, and again, it, it's a simplified way of doing it, but we have to do the same thing as countries within this region. We have to show that we can make the changes here, of course with the help from outside. We cannot you know, bump our chests and say, hey, we did it ourselves, as we usually do. It's in our history books. All of our failures are because of somebody from outside, and all of our victories are, you know, from our own. As the sooner we, 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 we join that collective spirit, the sooner we'll, we'll get our countries on the right path. Uh, I think I want to touch on the question here concerning nationalism and so on and so on. Because as an Austrian, uh, I shall do it. I think uh, if you ask me, are the Austrians a nation, I may say no. I think uh, we suffered a lot uh, on this question uh, after the end of the Habsburg monarchy, falling into pieces, uh, and then by the majority of the Austrians then afterwards was decided it should be a part of Germany. I may say thanks uh, to those who won the First World War, it was forbidden to do it. Uh, in consequence, we suffered a lot by the way, then going to the Third Reich, Hitler and so on and so on. We paid a huge price and we learned our lesson. I think nowadays, nobody, I think there's a huge majority in Austria saying we want to be independent, we are on our own. Uh, I think if you ask the Austrians, are you a nation, I think they won't answer it. Sometimes we tried to go around and we uh, created the expression Kulturnation, culture nation, whatever it means. I think it's coming out of uh, <coughs> the common identity which is created by, by culture, music, literature, and so on and so on, which is also a real nonsense because if you look to the impressive musicians, writers, architects, and so on and so on, they are coming from different parts outside Austria, and I think we are very much depending on this. Here you can see the total nonsense of this. I think uh, if we are able, I think, to identify ourselves by the experience uh, out of which is coming here, I think it's for sure necessary. There's an old joke, uh, I think, uh, look to the telephone book of Vienna and then you will see there are no Germans there, uh, because the names coming <laughs> in Vienna are different. And that's happening again by migration now. I think here the difficulties are not with uh, the lot of uh, those who are coming from the Balkans, uh, because uh, they are quite familiar and uh, there are a lot of connections. The difficulties are coming if they are coming from Near East. Uh, and I think here you can see that a certain kind of culture plays a very important role. Uh, those who are having a certain behavior are coming out of Islamic cultural tradition. I think the Bosniaks, uh, being Islamic, no problem. I think they are totally integrated. I think if they are coming from Afghanistan, uh, if they are coming from Chechnya and so on and so on, that's for sure more 
difficult uh, here. And I think we have to learn to live together. That's one of the extreme challenges for sure existing where we are doing not enough efforts on this uh, direction, even by the basics, to know how is the other, from where is he coming, what is his background, what is his history, that's not enough happening. I think we have huge possibilities by the medias, but uh, I think it's not really done. The medias, the modern medias, are, here, uh, are looking to the direction to make more distinctions and not to look what is really in common. And I think that's quite an important story we have to do. Well, we are running out of time, therefore, just a small example. I spent several years in Afghanistan, and uh, I would like to invite you to imagine what would have happened in Afghanistan if uh, hundreds of thousands of us entered Afghanistan ex except of ISAF. And migration, why I didn't touch it, Philip, is, uh, is very simple, I in, in my opinion, because uh, it's hard to swallow how, to see how Orban and others managed to squeeze out this topic for their political interests. But t talking or discussion about migration could be done in the other way around. Let's imagine if we won't have migrants at home in Germany, there won't be no, no nurses, no many public workers, even these low-level policemen, or what, what happened in your home country in the summer season without all these people coming there and offering services to tourists. And therefore, uh, we are talking about migration. I'm ready to do this, but in the other notion, not as a threat. And let's follow the talks in the chambers of commerce and all the others when they are talking about the problems of democracy and these aging societies. In this regard, I would accept any kind of discussion, but this migration as a threat, well, why to help them? So I will address, uh, be short, and I will address only one uh, of the questions, uh, which was, um, among the many alternatives, which one would you uh, prefer? Uh, and let me uh, have my bit of Ritutopia. Um, Europe was uh, funded initially in uh, an idea, many ideas. One of the ideas, very strong, was that of mobility, circulation of people and then goods and whatever else within a certain area. Now what we have, uh, migration is uh, the issue, what we have is this fear of mobility. Okay? All of a sudden, uh, what was a structural element of Europe, mobility, and what has been for centuries a structural element of dynamic societies is seen as a fearful object. I would prefer that. I would prefer a mobile Europe, an open Europe, something that has uh, the memory of where we would go and where we go uh, even now. You know, 100,000 uh, Italian youth leave the country every year, okay? I'm sure that in Hungary, many more leave than uh, what you receive from France England, Spain, or whatever. This idea of mobility is crucial to Europe and to the future of Europe, I think. Okay, <clears throat> I'll take up the, the question about simplifying the message. Uh, I also think that uh, it's not the, the language is not the problem. The problem for the left, as I see it, is that the ideas are worn out. Uh, that, uh, you know, in spite of uh, how long has it now been, you know, 15 or 20 years that we're talking about a crisis, but certainly since 2008 we're talking about a crisis, which is economic, financial, political, social, and so on, and the uh, kind of the parliamentary left, the social democrats are still saying the same thing as they always did. You know, it's a glo economic globalization is inevitable, and everybody has to adapt, and the best we can do is try and protect, you know, the remnants of uh, the welfare state as we built it. And um, so, you know, we still have 
I think that's the problem, that you can't really innovate with the language much because you're still sticking to that same idea, which for a lot of folks doesn't work. I mean, in, in Croatia, you know, sticking to this idea that you have to adapt has meant, now that we have a lot of comparative data from Eurostat, is that we are the worst performer in terms of precarious work. For instance, in, in the last year, we we're top of the 27 in terms of uh, temporary employment contracts. We are way down uh, at the bottom uh, with risk of poverty. We are also way down in the bottom in the declining uh, cost of labor. And so what we're, we're telling people to that you just have to adapt, you know, in glory. I mean, I like the idea of mobility, but the, the whole story of mobility is the four freedoms, you know, capital, services, goods, and people. And these don't flow freely, you know, in all directions. There are very strong, you know, um, patterns to mobility, right? And to evoke, since Bauman was evoked several times, he speaks about tourists and vagabonds. You know, tourists are those of us, I mean, I, I must include myself in that category, those who in an open Europe have all the, the credentials to move up, you know, take up, go wherever I want, find a job and, you know, um, leave in, uh, live in 10 different countries in my lifetime. These are the tourists, right? For those, really, indeed, the open Europe brings many new opportunities, but they are a small minority. Many are vagabonds, meaning they don't choose, you know, where they have to go. If you look at patterns of migration, there's, you know, hundreds and thousands of people leaving Romania, leaving Croatia, leaving uh, all these peripheral Eastern countries to work, you know, just to find basic living conditions. And what the right is telling them is, we'll stop this by uh, closing the borders. We'll stop. Brussels is to blame. So first of all, we'll take back sovereignty because all of this is like foreign conspiracy. You know, if you're in Poland, it's the Jews and whatever. So you create that first part of the narrative where you say we'll take back sovereignty and we'll stop the borders because, uh, you know, what a chimera this is that as if being Croatian is uh, good in itself and as if we're all the same because we're Croats. And of course we're not, you know, and that's where I think we need to work with our solutions because if material conditions for people don't improve, then evoking functional democracy is very cynical. You know, it becomes the cake and like if they don't have bread, give them cake. Yeah, I also wanted to pick up this question uh, whether someone disagrees here with the idea that a simplified language is a solution, but you actually more or less uh, <laughs> raised most of the points I wanted to raise in a much more perfect way that, than I can do this year, so I can be very short here, that I also kind of deeply disagree with this idea. It is a bit like saying the world is complex, let's simplify language and then we have reduced complexity. Uh, this is uh, an illusion. It is also a kind of absurdity, but it is also more than that because it's a way of deceiving actually uh, the people. Uh, the old word for this is uh, demagogy. It's a kind of demagogic uh, democracy. And the, and the illusion is also simply that language is not simple. Language in democracy only makes sense if language is translated into contestations, if there is a conflict, if there are conflicting meanings, then language in democracy makes sense. But the simplified language is not even uh, supporting uh, democracy. It needs to be contested. And also text is polysemic, as uh, linguists uh, would say. So the simple message of Trump, I have uh, the bigger bottom, what was it again? Uh, something like this. This is not uh, a clear message because it is very polysemic. It can be understood, it can be misunderstood. So interpretation of this apparently simple uh, sentence can go into all kind of directions. And uh, if such sentences are misunderstood, they can actually even trigger an atomic war. And this is uh, be, uh, uh, precisely uh, the danger behi uh, behind such uh, simplified language. I was surprised how many times Trump was mentioned in a dialogue uh, dedicated to Europe. And I mean, and also we are, so we are all fascinated in a way, in this perverse sense, we are fascinated with Trump and his use of simple language as it is called. But I don't think that we are losing, when I say we, I think mainstream politicians or whatever, social democrats, we are not losing to Trump and his likes because we are, our language is too sophisticated for ordinary people to understand. We are losing to Trump because we used this sophisticated language to legitimize growing tendencies of technicization of democracy 
which was uh, actually a tendency uh, which grow, uh, e uh, increasingly excluded people from decision-making processes. Now what is Trump, Trump is doing is he's giving these simple languages and giving promises that he will uh, bring power back to the people. And of course, Trump and his likes are not doing that. Uh, they are lying, but that's what they are, the, 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 that's the promise they are, they are doing. Whereas this technocratic and sophisticated language is just a legitimizing tool uh, for, uh, for excluding more and more people from politics. Um, it's in a way, in a very broad, in a very, um, I don't know, uh, complex way, it's, it's, it's connected to some other questions raised in the audience. It was interesting that Hungary, and Hungary was mentioned and the, the anti, anti-migration discourse, and of course, as, as was already said, Hungary and Poland, they are not under any threat of, of uh, migration. However, anti-migration discourses are very, very important there. Why? Because, because of the sovereignty. I mean, sovereignty issue is actually the crucial here, in my opinion, not just the traditional term sovereignty in like a political legal sense, national sovereignty, sovereignty of the state, it's just this idea, we're not gonna have Brussels tell us how many migrants we have to uh, uh, let in. We're gonna decide. And I think that we should take uh, more seriously this idea of, so of people's need to have their opinions and their, to, to their people's need to be sovereign in a way, in a way that they are able to exercise power or to have their ideas um, become part of, of governing structures or something. So uh, sovereignty in a, in a more abstract and philosophical uh, way. And I'll end here and now I will switch to my role of organizer and invite you all to have drinks in this <laughs> other room so we can chat more about uh, migrants, Trump and the future of Europe. <laughs> Thank you, Elena. Thank you. Guys.